snow, open it, and stick your head out and yell. We are busy, busy, busy at BMC today, and I am very honoured and delighted to have a special guest with me in the Audio Mango van right here, right now, the one and only Judge Jules. Welcome, Jules. How are we? <laughs> We're very, very well. How are you doing? Uh, Britain, which is traditionally a country where it's drizzly, is so much better when the sun shines. Isn't it just it? changes everything. Everybody loves the sunshine, don't they? Sing the song if you want. <laughs> oh, go on. <laughs> Everybody loves the sunshine. Oh, now Jules is do singing do do to do. me. <laughs> uh, what more could I want? <laughs> so tell me, Jules, what brings you to Brighton Music Conference today? Well, I live this. I live a, a kind of dual lane life. I DJ. Surprise. I, I, I still have to look at myself in the mirror and think after all these decades, I'm still really busy with DJing. But for the last 10 years, I've had a specialist music law practice. And I that's it's right. not just dealing in, in electronic music, but obviously that's a real strength of my practice. Based in, in King's Cross in London, um, I look after a lot of quite big people within the electronic music world. Mm -hmm. And it's been great. It's great to kind of focus one's attention on others. And yeah. so I'm kind of here in that capacity, really, as opposed to here in DJ capacity, because it is, it is daytime after all. It is daytime after all. And um, and that's where, you know, that it's always been a part of your life, hasn't it? You know, we had Judge Jules came for, Judge Jules' name came for a reason. Um, you know, when you did, was it your, your law degree when you came out? Was, you tell me, take us back well, to, yes and no. take yeah, us I back I to where the law started in your world. <laughs> yeah, the law, <laughs> when I was banged up, no. Um, no, I, um, I did, to get, I got a law degree when I was 21, graduated right, when yeah. I was 21. Um, but th by that point, my DJ career was, was doing all right. Um, so I never really used it. But then I sort of got to my mid thirties and at that point there weren't really many DJs of any dare I say it, success and busyness older than me. There were a few sort of there was kind of Carl Cox and Paul Oakenfold and Pete Tong, but not too many others. Mm. Therefore there was no kind of career uh, obvious career path for being a DJ. And for me I wanted to I wanted I, I, I love being in the music business and I thought, you know, I've got a I've got a plan for life beyond DJing. So mm. I sort of secretly went whilst sort of being on Radio One whilst touring, went back to law school, and over the period of That's five years, it, right? five years doing it as slowly as one could, sort right. of part time. Because with most qualifications, you can do them fast, or you can do them quite slowly. I did it as slowly as I could uh -huh. over five years. Didn't really tell anybody because I didn't want it to become like a self fulfilling prophecy that I wasn't going to be DJing. I wa it wasn't an intention not to DJ. I just wanted sure. to have a have a a game plan to go into my sort of you know fifties and sixties. Yeah. So did that. Um, Started as a lawyer with a, uh, another firm ten years ago. Right. Um, s for the last four years, I've been a partner at sort of a firm that I have a, a part of, yeah. uh, based in Tile Yard in Kings Cross. And what I didn't realise was that the DJing was still going to remain very, very strong. But I, actually, I think being a lawyer and and getting a greater understanding of the way, you know, the secrets, if you like, yeah. of the music business that only really lawyers and people who are very party to private information about the way that other creatives run their business has been so beneficial to me as a DJ. So mm. um, dare I say it, when I soon after becoming a lawyer, I changed my management, uh, my manager had managed me for a long time mm -hmm. just because it needed a shake up at yep. the time. And, um, and, 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 and then fast forward 10 years and the legal practice is going super, super well and gigs are going incredibly. Yeah, so, I know, you're super um, busy. So, uh, but, but, but I never, I, I didn't, I, I saw it as, to use really sort of crass DJ metaphors, I, I saw it as being a crossfade between two careers. But it and wasn't. actually, they're both now in the mix it's together. It's just another yeah. string to the bow, isn't yeah. it, really? And, uh, you know, uh, funnily enough, Mighty Mouse was in here uh, last, and he said one of his uh, bits of advice was to have a good lawyer for a DJ. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I think it is something that um, hasn't, you know, in our industry, it wasn't uh, the legal side of things for many, many DJs that, you know, were were not protected in that way. Um, oh and no, absolutely, myself included. I mean, I was the, I was the most dangerous thing because I had a law degree, but I wasn't a lawyer for, for many years until my mid-30s. Yeah, yeah. And so you had but, but I thought but I knew what I was doing and yeah. I really, really didn't. didn't and signed yeah. some really bad deals. But I think the, the, the best thing for me is because I've done... A, you know, being a DJ, being a radio presenter, promoter, A and R, uh, I've done kind of most things in 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 the industry. Mm -hmm. So I'm dare I say, I feel I'm more capable of explaining what it is that people are signing. Yeah, uh, than, you know than, than almost. 
But it's, it's not just knowing all sides, it's understanding how to explain it, really. Right. Because I signed so... When I was younger, before I was a lawyer, I signed so many contracts, I literally didn't know what, what it was I was doing, signing. Yeah. And I, was, I was too proud to admit to my lawyer of the time that I didn't know what the hell I was signing. And yeah. sometimes it was fine, and they'd advise me correctly. And, and on other occasions, I signed really quite stupid things because I was too... I wouldn't, I wouldn't say arrogant, but you know, too proud to admit. And now my, you know, for me, my, my f number one mantra doing what I do as a lawyer is to just say, the first thing I say to anybody I look after, and I look after some really quite well-known people, is like, don't be shy. I know you won't understand a lot of this and it's nothing to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. I want you to know everything that you're signing. You know, you can't explain every last kind of, you know, dot and uh, cross on the T, but that's, you know, that is really, really important. That's the job, isn't it, that you're doing to make you help help them to understand, and so that they do know what they're signing at the end of the day. Because I I think everybody in life are often signs things away when they go, oh yeah yeah I'll just do that, and or I won't look at the terms and conditions, and you know I won't go into it further. And having that throughout life, whether it be in DJ or, or you know any kind of business. Uh, having that protection is something really, really important. And, uh, you know, I know it's something I definitely lacked over the years on the other side. I'm not, I'm not an artist, but on the business side of working in the music industry, you know, it can be really, really hard when you haven't got that understanding of the legal side and when lawyers are really, really expensive as well. Well, that's, <laughs> um, the, that's the other and, thing. I mean, I, I, know, I, mean, I speak, I, I will do up to 20 calls a day, probably... Mm a quarter to a third of those are for artists, new artists who just get in touch, ask a question or two. I won't charge them anything. Yeah, that's I'll a, just that's I'll just brilliant. have a conversation because I well, part of it part of it is, you know, trying to be sort of decent because I've got other clients who do pay good money and are quite happy to do so because they're generating generating It's give and take, income, isn't but, it? Yeah. Um, for me it's it's almost like you know when when I started in the dance music industry, which was basically in the around the era of the acid house raves. It was a it was like a cottage industry that yeah. suddenly went mainstream, and it and it got increasingly mainstream over the 90s with the super clubs. And then you then in the noughties you had if you like the big Vegas clubs, and you had and then it, you know, at that point it became seriously mainstream mm. and seriously corporate. Mm. And as so much as money in involved, right? Loads of money, and I, I don't mean necessarily just amongst the artists, I mean people who created businesses. So more and more it has become important to, you know, to be quite professional about things. And I think the other big point is that the great thing about doing what I do, you know, when you're an artist, to be successful, you've got to be a little bit selfish. It's mm. an awful thing to say, but it's true. And mm. it's just, you know, privately, most successful artists will admit to that. Yeah, um, it's but, getting the balance but, on it, uh, isn't it? But yeah. At the, yeah, but at the same time, you know, you've got to, um, you've got to trust people around you um uh, and and so i get this kind of it's amazing the what i've learned about other artists and the the deeper level of artists you know it's it's all very well just looking at contracts and talking about percentages and royalties and and rights and all the rest of it but actually what you learn about the inner the psyche of the people you're dealing with the story because all creatives have got a story they've all got a bit of inner inner madness if you like but but i uh, but i don't say that in a patronizing way because yeah. i've got a bit of inner madness to, to myself really, as well. yeah. we've all got things in our lives that have been you know made us the way we are and i find that element of it very fascinating because obviously when you're having a quite an in-depth relationship with a lot of different people in the music business who are sensible successful and mature enough to open up a little bit i, I find that element of it really fascinating as well so that's my side of the industry that's kind of really very much where i've been uh in the last 20 years of my, so my relationships in the industry of uh, you know looking after djs um and having thousands of djs go through my doors if want of better words um the relationships and the psych psyche and the um, the buzz that I get from uh, understanding how to uh, help people to open up and be creatively free um, and the relationship I have with many, many, many DJs over the years. I mean, you know what a manager, DJ, agent, DJ relationship is like. You know, it's something that is a daily thing um, and it's a very, very close thing. And for me, the duty of care 
um, of uh, looking after DJs and representing DJs. That was that was my my fa this is my favourite side of it because the relationships, the stories, the experiences, the journeys we go on, all of these things was you know and and seeing them fly and seeing them happy and and you know uh, there's an awful lot of yin and yang that goes with DJing. Um, so you know there's there's the high points and there's the low points when they're back in the back in the hotel room and not feeling so great and that's when Sasha gets wrong. <laughs> um but i i'm i it's not that i enjoy those moments but i i i value the um that they can talk to me and open up to me and say oh you know it was an amazing gig but i don't feel great now or you know these kinds of things and it's not always that side of it but agony sasha kind of thing at times um but i i this it's not it's not like i'm I'm uh, dissecting it and going, oh, this is, you know, fascinating. It is, it's something that I get an awful lot out of being able to help people. And that's, that's my truest sense of uh, what I get most out of my side of the job. You know, I go on the radio now and, and now I'm on the TV. But I've never, you know, in the last 20 years since I left page three modelling and started working for Sirius and did Scream and all of that kind of thing, I've kind of been behind the camera rather than in front of the camera. Um, and so it's all of that side that has made me buzz and uh, you know that's been my my um my job as it were so it's really interesting to hear you say that and be sitting here with you because you know Sirius was a massive part of my life um you've been playing for many a night that I did over the years for many years and and so and I've always had an awful lot of respect for you Jules on the your professionalism um, because in an industry that is very unprofessional at times and has been over the last 30 years, uh, having people that are professional and understand that I came from a corporate background myself. Before I was a pastry model, I, came, I was working in Lloyds of London um, and I did seven years in reinsurance. And so it's that corporate background I came from and then went into the music industry, which is madness. <laughs> yeah, I think it's quite an interesting world where... Um, you don't, as as an artist, um, you have to have a story. And, and and I look at some of the artists who've come through recently. Uh, a good example is the is the DJ John Summit, who makes really good records and has really done very very well in the last two or three years. He's from Chicago, yeah, no but no. he's really interesting on social media as well. And he and actually he's not somebody that I know at all. Mm. But I. I, I, I love I, I, I do think the story behind the artist oh, yeah. and is, 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 is a fascinating one because yeah. there's so many common themes I mean, and, and it applies to DJs or musicians that tend to be or, 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 or other artists mm. that, that the, the, the consistency of some element of the life story of successful artists that's you know a moment of sadness or a moment of tragedy I mean is certainly in my life there was I lost my mother very young um, but it's very very it's, it's, it's fascinating and mm. I think it's the good thing about the current environment is that people can can talk about it more. It's starting to open up now. That's been the uh, which has always been you know it's been quite difficult for for men. And I was um, more so during my time at Radio One. I was very involved with the charity Calm, which is a yep. which is a campaign against li living mis miserably, which is about basically getting guys to open up and talk to one another. Um, mm. Uh, which I, which guys are not very good at doing, and no, I, and I think right. that that I think that landscape's changed uh, enormously, and it's fa it's strange that this conversation's morphed from talking about me and my legal practice <laughs> um, to talking about that. But to me, mm. I think that element of duty of care um, extends for me personally extends to my life as a lawyer, and it yeah. doesn't mean that I would necessarily get involved in this sort of conversation with everybody that I represent because some people you do a deal for them you get the contract done you get them to get some money and, and then you might not see them again for a couple of years yeah. until something else is necessary but there are other clients that I deal with on a very regular basis with whom I have a very very close relationship almost a quasi managerial relationship with yeah. and I and, and for me that is a great experience because mm. um, uh, the interesting thing about management is that when I when I became a lawyer I, I was you know with, with, with a long-standing artistic background I was like screw you managers I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do everything I can for the artist right Fuck the managers <laughs> and then I then I actually took a step back started representing a lot of managers many of whom I've got enormous time for and realized just how difficult it is to be an artist manager mm. um, both 
emotionally, time-wise, and even more so financially, because you know most managers in the music industry, whether it's of DJs or regular musicians, are on 20% of the profit their artist makes. Now, to be on to be on 20% of profit means your artist has got to be turning a profit of 100 grand a year. There ain't many artists out there that are earning that much money. So for for, for a manager to earn minimum wage, they've got they've re literally got a bet hope that their artist goes on to be successful now of course a lot of managers will have more than one artist but they can't have many because you can't spread yourself you haven't too got thin. the time now it's a physical um, thing but it, but again it's a very uh, the dynamic of the manager artist relationships a fascinating one because because the nature of being an artist is that you have to be uh, i mentioned it before and i don't say it with pride but it's a reality you have to be a bit selfish yeah and very very thick skinned to be successful very sensitive but very thick skinned and of course, what does what does thick? How does being thick-skinned manifest itself? It manifests itself in not being. If something goes wrong, if if you if if there are negatives in your career, you can't blame yourself. It's no. it just it's just not in your DNA to blame yourself mm. unless you're already very successful and very self-confident. Mm. So what do you do? You turn ninety degrees, and who who is facing you ninety degrees on? It's your manager, of course. Scapegoat uh, Sasha. And and, then that, <laughs> and 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 that is kind of what happens. Um, mm. But it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic. Um, it's funny because we could have spoken for ages about DJing, but you know, and I've got a super busy summer and loads of interesting gigs. But it's a bit more uninteresting to talk about that than to talk about the deeper level of what I've what I've learned about the music industry. Because some of that stuff, I think, is a really I think there are great lessons to be learned, and it's funny. I'm, so I'm here, maybe as a, as a, as a parting thing, I'm going to say here at Brighton Music Conference. I've been involved with Bright BMC since its inception. I've been yeah. here every year, and I've been on the legal panel. Mm. And it's funny on the legal panel some year. So there will be three or four lawyers talking about a current theme in in music. Um, today we're talking about music publishing. Uh, some years it's been relatively busy. Other, other years it's not been very busy, which sort of pisses me off because I the one the other observation and this is my sort of parting observation yeah. for for up and coming uh, DJs or music makers. The one thing you've got a bit well, the one thing I've noticed about everybody that I that I work with in my legal practice amongst the artists is they are all switched on as fuck. They yep. are so business savvy. Yes. You, you you have got to be the complete individual. You've got to be, you know, great at making music, obviously. Um, great at marketing yourself and really ha be really be savvy about the business, business decisions side. you make. Albeit sometimes with, with a manager. So it so my my suggestion is, even though law might seem like the, and I'm probably the dare boring I a little, bit. dare I say I'm probably more <laughs> exciting than your average lawyer, but, <laughs> but at the same time I'm still a lawyer. Um, but it's a really really important thing to take seriously. You know, if you please don't ever think if you're an aspiring artist that your music alone will be enough to propel you. It will you never to will. It never however will. However great ever. you are. However great I, you are. I I have known so many artists that have had the most amazing music. And it, you know they never get that light of day. Yeah. Um, you know their music might get out a little bit, but for what the quality of the music compared to uh, where they get to is just non-existent. Um, and that often is you know all of these other sides that let it down. So you know you've got the, the you know they're they're putting out the right music, but on a business side, on a professional side, you know dare I say it, it's not all about the girls, champagne and cocaine. It really isn't. Um, and that can be a real route to destruction rather than a route to success. Uh, yeah, everybody wants the DJ to be the party boy or the party girl, um, but there is a, a, a real, real balance that needs to be had because it is a business. If you want a career in it, you have to look at it like that, um, and you have to get that balance on it all the sides. And it's, you know, uh, you know. I don't know. Oh, I've, I've always going. been the. I, I've always been three out of ten on the party scale. I wouldn't <laughs> say I'm naught out of ten, but I've never even been over five out of ten. Yeah. I, you know, an after party. At and my every, house, everybody's I'll, different. Be, I'll be going to bed before everybody yeah, else. I know. Just guaranteed, <laughs> guaranteed. And, and I'm proud. It. It's probably why I'm, why I'm got the crow's feet aren't as bad as they are. Um, you know, Sasha, it's been it lovely speaking. professional side. It has been absolutely <laughs> lovely, Jules. Uh, have a great panel. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much, and hopefully we'll get the van to you again soon. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much, everyone.